Welcome to the 2018-2019 Ab Safety Seminar Series. This seminar we've entitled Enhancing Pilot Skills in a Dynamic Environment. The reason why we've used the word dynamic is because when we go flying, things rarely stay the same for very long. Things are constantly changing. And as a result, our human factors needs to keep up with the operation that we're undertaking. So today in our presentation, the information that we're going to give you is applicable to you no matter what you fly. You could be flying an RPT turboprop, you could be flying an IFR twin, you could be into sport aviation like gliding or parachuting. It doesn't matter what you fly. The human factors concepts that we're going to explore today are applicable all the way across the board. There's three things that we're going to look at in our presentation today. The first is communication. Why communication? Well, because the way we communicate when we're in the air has significant challenges, significant challenges for us to overcome. And the way we communicate in the air is often very different to the way we communicate when we're on the ground, just chatting to people face to face. The second thing we're going to look at is situational awareness. Now, situational awareness by itself is a huge, huge area of study. People go to university for many years and, and study all the ins and outs of situational awareness. First of all, what it is, and secondly, to perhaps identify some of the red flags that you might be able to recognise in your own flying that might be clues to the fact that you might be losing situational awareness. And the third thing that we're going to look at today is a concept called threat and error management. Threat and error management has been around in the aviation industry now for a couple of decades, and it's becoming more and more important in the way we go flying. So let's have a look at communication. As I said at the outset, the way we communicate in the air is often significantly different and has a host of different challenges to the way we normally communicate when we're on the ground. And ATSB research bears out the fact that communication is an important factor when we go flying. Non-towered aerodromes, which is the focus of our presentation today, they're a central component of the Australian airspace system. And when we go through the ATSB accident database, they've identified issues to do with communication, situational awareness, and threat and error management as being contributing factors to a whole host of different incidents and accidents in this realm. The ATSB research also indicates that problems with communication and situational awareness in particular do lead or do have the potential to lead to accidents. Not only uh, insufficient communication, but also communication that is inaccurate or even too much communication in the circuit area where the CTAF frequency gets certainly very busy. And that in itself presents us with challenges to maintain the safety of flight. Let's perhaps start with a bit of a case study. This case study was an incident that occurred at Port Macquarie Airport. This incident occurred about 12 years ago, back in 2007. Port Macquarie, of course, is a regional aerodrome on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. It's a reasonably busy airport, has a large flying school, and it also has an RPT service that comes up from Sydney. There are two runways, a sealed runway and a small cross strip. And as you can see from the photograph, the, the suburbs of Port Macquarie are now starting to encroach in, into the boundaries of this airport. We have nothing against Port Macquarie, but this, is, this example is a classic case of where breakdowns in communication have the potential for serious safety implications. So let's set the scene with regards to the four players or the four actors, if you like, in our scenario. Now we've identified these four aircraft in the vicinity of Port Macquarie Airport. These aircraft aren't exactly where they might be depicted in the picture, but they at least give you a relative uh, direction from the airport to help build our mental picture. So let's start the process. The first aircraft that we're going to look at is a Dash 8. The Dash 8, as you know, as many people know, is a twin turboprop uh, commuter aircraft. This Dash 8 was doing a regular public transport flight. It was coming inbound from the south, from Sydney, inbound to Port Macquarie. This Dash 8 was an IFR aircraft, and it was inbound for runway 03, which is the sealed runway there at Port Macquarie. The second actor in our scenario is a Beechcraft Baron. This aircraft was a twin engine machine, often used for personal transport, but in this instance, it was an IFR training exercise. This aircraft 
was inbound from the southwest and they were performing a GNSS approach onto runway 03. The Baron and also the Dash 8, they were both IFR aircraft. So the chances are that they knew of each other's existence. They would have been given traffic on each other by Melbourne Centre, and they certainly would have been chatting to each other on the Port Macquarie CTAF frequency. Let's have a look at the third aircraft in our scenario. The third aircraft in our scenario was a Cessna 152. They were also using runway 03 and they were departing to the north on a navigation exercise. So now we come to the final actor in our scenario. The final piece of the puzzle was an RA Oz Foxbat aircraft and they were taxiing for circuits on runway 21. Now that's the first perhaps little chink in the armour that we can see here. We have three aircraft that have nominated and are using runway 03, but unfortunately our fourth aircraft, for reasons which we'll discuss later in the presentation, has decided to use runway 21. So let's keep building the scenario and building that mental picture as we go. The Cessna 152 broadcasts its departure call as it leaves runway 03, but unfortunately is over-transmitted by the Foxbat. Over-transmission, which essentially means that there are two radio calls in at once from different stations, has a potential to be an instant breakdown in situational awareness and presents enormous problems for communication. Calls can't be understood, calls can't be deciphered or heard properly when there's two stations over transmitting each other. Instant loss of situational awareness. Upon hearing this over transmission, the Dash 8 pilots, what they do is they jump on the CTAF frequency and they ask for a repeat of both of these broadcasts from the pilots. But in actual fact, it's only the Cessna 152 that repeats its broadcast. There's no repeat broadcast from the Foxbat. The Dash 8 is overflying for runway 03, but lo and behold sees the Foxbat actually rolling for takeoff head to head on runway 21. As you can see, this has enormous safety, safety implications. The first thing that the, the Dash 8 does is jump on the CTAF frequency and advise the Beechcraft Baron that they are head to head with an aircraft taking off towards them. The Baron upon hearing this does a very wise thing and exits stage left and conducts a go round from short final. It resolves this conflict by getting out of the immediate area. But we still have the situation whereby we have a Dash 8 in the vicinity of the circuit for 03 with unfortunately a Foxbat coming straight at them. The scenario develops even further and we find that the Foxbat actually takes off on runway 21. As you can see, a very dangerous or the potential for a, uh, a, an air proximity event is rapidly occurring. So what the Dash 8 has to do is modify their circuit entry to maintain separation with the Foxbat. Please be aware that uh, Dash 8 aircraft and larger turboprop aircraft, the larger aircraft and faster aircraft, they usually give their first inbound call at about 30 miles from the airport as they come down through about 10,000 feet. They're moving down the slope at about four miles a minute, so they'll be in the circuit area in about seven minutes or so from about 30 miles. The workload in the cockpit of the Dash 8 is usually quite high and the visibility outside the cockpit is often quite poor. So the last thing they want to be doing, if at all possible, is doing manoeuvring in the circuit, which involves often significant angles of bank, changes of power, changes of configuration. So at the last minute, as you can see from our diagram, the Dash 8 has to modify its circuit entry to maintain separation with the Foxbat. But as you'll see from the next slide that I'm going to put up, things don't resolve themselves immediately. What happens is that further in the circuit, the Dash 8 has to do a go around when the Foxbat cuts in front of that Dash 8 on short final. This is not a good state of events. Now this Dash 8 might have anywhere between 50 and 70 people on board, and we're flying around and overhead the suburbs of Port Macquarie. Not a good state of affairs. The go round actually by the Dash 8, when the Foxbat pilot was interviewed after this event, was in fact the very first time that that Foxbat pilot became aware that there was any other aircraft in the circuit. Now certainly we're not here to lay blame or to pass judgment on the Foxbat pilot because here but for the grace of God go you and I. We've all made mistakes in these types of environments. But as you can see from the scenario that we've described, 
Breakdowns in communication can have serious ramifications in the air safety space. So what happened then? The Foxbat then made a probably a good decision and actually departed the circuit to troubleshoot what they thought was a radio problem. This was a good decision by the Foxbat pilot because it got the Foxbat away from other aircraft. Many pilots have had to troubleshoot issues when they're in the air. These issues might be problems with electrics, problems with the flap, engine problems. Two pieces of advice that I often provide when I run this seminar to pilots, if they do have a problem when they're airborne, many of us have had this, is to perhaps think about doing two things if we do have a problem in the air. The first thing is to get away from other aircraft, and the second thing is to get away from the ground. The last thing we want to be doing is trying to troubleshoot an issue with our aircraft while we're mixing it in the circuit in close proximity to other aircraft. So the Foxpat pilot went away from the airport, tried to troubleshoot their problem. So what happened? The pilot couldn't determine the problem with their radio while they were airborne, but upon landing back again at Port Macquarie and shutting down, another pilot found that the entire issue had a causal factor, which was basically that the pilot had neglected to turn the volume up on their radio. It's quite telling, isn't it, that something as small as forgetting to turn the volume up can have potentially serious ramifications for aviation safety. And it was only due to the fact that communication was hindered because volume wasn't turned up. Again, no one's immune to this. I'm sure many of us have been flying where we've either had the volume turned up or we've been on the wrong frequency. But what this does show us is that if we have a breakdown in communication or the ability to communicate over the radio is somewhat hindered, the ramifications for safety further down the track can potentially be massive. The pilot was aware that Port Macquarie had what we call an aerodrome frequency response unit or an AFRU. Essentially, this is a small piece of kit that confirms to the pilot in command that their radio is on the correct frequency. If there's been no communication on that CTAF in the last five minutes, the pilot will hear back in their headset an automatic voice, in this instance saying Port Macquarie CTAF. It provides the pilot with confirmation that their radio is on the right frequency and the volume is appropriate. If there's been no transmission on the CTAF within the last five minutes, they'll just get a short tone in their headset. Now in discussions with the Foxpat pilot subsequent to this event, it turned out that the Foxbat pilot, as they were taxiing, saw or noticed a helicopter depart about five minutes before. So it could reasonably be concluded that the Foxbat pilot came to the decision that that helicopter was the only other aircraft that they had to worry about. Of course, that doesn't preclude pilots from looking out and using alert and see and avoid, but we'll discuss some of that later. The Foxbat pilot's intention, therefore, was to gain all their traffic information just from radio calls from other aircraft. We take away the radio call or the ability to make a radio call with the volume turned down, and all of a sudden we're essentially flying in a deaf environment where we can't hear what's going on. All the other aircraft have, however, they were quite successfully using the Port Macquarie CTAF frequency to arrange their own mutual separation. And that's what the CTAF frequency is for. We've spoken about communication in the aviation environment. It begs the question, doesn't it? How do we as, as human beings communicate in the non-aviation environment? Now, there's been many studies at universities around the world in the human factors associated with communication. What studies do show is that the vast majority of the way we communicate as people is in the non-verbal space rather than the verbal space. In fact, some studies show up to 93% of our communication as humans occurs in a non-verbal way. First of all, there's the acoustic way we communicate, not only just with our voice, but even the tone of our voice or even using expression in our voice. Things like the uh, appropriate use of pauses, okay, or even sounds. Another big way we communicate is by optical or visual means. In the Aviation Safety Advisor role, we see thousands of pilots all over Australia every year in hundreds of seminars. And one of the biggest ways we can communicate or the audience communicates to us is through essentially body language. We can tell a lot about how people are feeling or what their, their mood is just by body language how they hold their arms, how they hold their face, even things like facial expressions, even things like 
the, the clothes that people are wearing. I was at an airport once, I remember two pilots getting out of an aircraft at the fuel bowser. These pilots had wrinkled shirts on, food stains, their shirts were untucked, their shoes weren't polished. These pilots looked disgusting. I therefore came, rightly or wrongly, to the conclusion that these pilots were unsafe. Because I've also seen pilots at airports that have had nice uniforms that have been ironed, um, their, their, their shoes are polished, they're wearing a tie. Instantly I come to the conclusion that these pilots are somehow safe. That might be a wrong or a right conclusion, I'm not sure. But that's how people do communicate, even by the clothes we wear. If I go out uh, in, into a, a, an outback cattle station to talk to mustering pilots, I'm not going to wear a suit and tie. I'm going to wear something appropriate. We communicate a lot, even just with the clothes that we wear. The other way we also communicate is in a tactile sense. Putting your arm around someone or putting a hand on the shoulder. Again, it's a non-verbal way of communicating to other individuals. And finally, we can communicate with what the scientists call the olfactory sense, which is things like smells or odours. And people think often when I mention this, really, is that true? But think about the, the global perfume and, and aftershave industry. It's worth billions of dollars. Why? Because that's a way people can communicate. So there's heaps and heaps of different ways that we can communicate in a non-verbal sense. How does this relate to aviation? Well, when we're in the cockpit, we don't get the value or we don't get the benefit of non-verbal communication. All we are is a voice on the end of a CTAF frequency, for example, appearing through someone's headset. And potentially, that can be as little as 10% of the way that humans communicate. So when we go flying, we are in an environment that is very, very challenging for effective communication. And that's why our communication has to be spot on and we have to continually work at it to be effective. Because effective communication gives us the greatest chance of staying alive out there when we go flying around the CTAF environment. So, communication in the aviation environment. Here's an old adage that people have been saying for ages, but we've slightly modified it. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words, words have the potential to kill me. How is that the case? Words that are perhaps indecipherable, words that are too many, words that are insufficient or even the wrong words. And Air Services Australia and the AIP, they're very hot on what we call standard phraseology. Standard phraseology is a vital part of our communication because when we talk on the radio to either air traffic control or to other aircraft, the other party has to know that we know. And therefore, this standard communication is so important. I listen to, in my job, radio frequencies all over Australia. And I can tell you, it is often quite rare to hear a stock standard AIP radio call. Often we hear mishmashes of all different types of calls all mixed in together. Student pilots, and especially foreign student pilots who come to Australia to learn to fly, whose English might be somewhat at a less of a standard than a native Australian-born English speaker, these pilots sit in the classroom and they go through their AIP. And when they learn the standard format of phrases, when they go flying, that's what they expect to actually hear. Australians as a rule, we do have behaviours on the radio that do have problems for communication in the aviation environment. Often Australian pilots, we speak too quickly. We often use a lot of slang. And many times when we communicate on the radio, we start talking maybe half a second before that press to talk button goes down. So we can often clip the start of our transmissions. So we have to just every now and then maybe do a, a readjust and have a think about how we ourselves communicate on the radio. And finally, when we communicate on the radio, think about what we are about to say before we hit the button. The press to talk or the PTT button is a press to talk button. It's actually not a press to think button. Have an idea of what we're about to say, who we are going to address that call to. Is it a specific broadcast or is it a call to a specific individual? Think about our standard phraseology. And when we are in the CTAF environment, one of the things that we need to consider is that before we make the radio call, is the radio call that we're about to make likely to increase people's situational awareness 
or is it likely to actually impact or decrease people's situational awareness? The radio is a very, very powerful tool. And by thinking about what we're about to say and using standard phraseology, we will go a long way to helping the safety of flight, especially in the non-towered aerodrome environment. There are barriers to effective communication. Communicating in the airborne environment has enormous challenges set before it. Let's have a look at what some of these challenges might be. The first thing is the physical conditions. Now I know there aren't many open cockpit aircraft flying around the country, but a lot of aircraft have noisy cockpits. Many of us perhaps haven't had our headsets serviced in years or even our radios looked at. So, so think about the quality of our transmission. High workload environments. If we are in a high workload environment, taxiing at a complex aerodrome in the middle of our takeoff sequence, if we're maneuvering around the circuit or in our landing phase, these are high workload environments. And as a consequence, this can represent a challenge to effective communication if we are just so busy doing other things at the same time. Fatigue. Fatigue's an interesting one. If we are tired, if we are so fatigued, often we exhibit behaviours that can be potentially hazardous. And one of those is the inability to communicate properly. What do I mean by this? Well, let's look at an analogy. You might have worked a 60 hour week. You come home on a Friday night and you're absolutely tired. All you want to do is pour yourself a drink and just sit on the couch and maybe watch Friday night football. If you are so tired, if someone walks in the room and wants an in-depth conversation with you, are you in the mood to actually engage? Most likely not. Fatigue is one of those insidious things that can creep up on us and it affects us in many different ways and it affects individuals differently. But one of the common things we're seeing with fatigue is that it does impact adversely on our ability to be effective communicators. Interruption and distraction. Probably out of all of these factors, this is probably the main one. There are lots of potential interruptions and distractions in the aviation environment. It might be air traffic control, it might be passengers, it might be other things that we're doing in the cockpit. Interruption and distraction has a huge impact on our ability to communicate. Stress. If we're flying and we are in a stressful environment, we might be dealing with unfamiliar airspace, we might be flying an unfamiliar aircraft, or we could potentially be dealing with an emergency. In a stressful situation, we tend to shut down all the periphery and just concentrate on what we're dealing with at that time. Again, that has ramifications for our ability to communicate. And finally, culture. English language, accents, flying in the vicinity with people who English is not their first language, even using colloquialisms or local land features in our communication. We should always, always, always think about what our intended audience is. They might not know where Joe's farm is, for example. We need to use information that everyone has an understanding of. So what are some of the hints and techniques that we can use to improve our technique on the radio? Here are some that I'd like to present to you just to perhaps have a think about. The first is, is the volume correctly turned up and am I on the right frequency? It might seem simple, but I'm sure many of us have been flying when we've been on the wrong frequency or we've been flying with the volume turned down. Volume being turned down is often a trap for instructors where they need to perhaps reduce the distraction of the radio while they're teaching a sequence and sometimes we get to turn the volume back up to normal levels afterwards. The second thing is think about what information that I'm about to transmit. Is it to a specific party or is it a general broadcast? Is it likely to increase people's situational awareness or will it run the risk of reducing people's situational awareness, especially when there might be a lot of aircraft in the circuit area. And listen out before transmitting to prevent over transmitting or blocking other calls. A classic case of this is when we're making our inbound call. For example, don't get to a 10 mile from the airport and then flick across and start transmitting straight away. Maybe flick across about 30 seconds beforehand, have a bit of a listen out to find out what the story is, build your situational awareness, then wait for an appropriate break in the transmission and then make your own. Non-ambiguous language. This goes back to our earlier discussion on standard phraseology because the other party needs to know exactly what's required. 
So if at all possible, try and avoid using things like slang or local land features. Try and keep it as much as possible, a broader transmission with commonly known features when describing perhaps where you are. And the final one, and this is also a big one too. If you are in the receipt of a transmission that is often spoken very quickly, or there are terms in that transmission that you don't understand, please don't be hesitant to ask for a repeat from either the pilot that made the transmission or the air traffic control unit. When dealing with air traffic control, if they give you, for example, an instruction that you can't comply with, it might be due to things like weather or aircraft equipment or any other host of factors, don't try and fudge your way through. If you can't comply with an instruction from ATC, say that you can't comply, and then ATC will be duty bound to provide you with an alternative. Sure, it might mean that you might have to wait outside controlled airspace, or they, you might be vectored somewhere else, or there might be a few increased track miles or a slight delay, but please don't try and fudge your way through if you can't comply with an ATC instruction. Please tell them, and they will be duty bound to provide you with an alternative. So, Going back to our scenario that we launched our seminar series with today, the pilot of the Foxbat assumed that the lack of radio calls therefore meant a lack of other traffic because the pilot of the Foxbat did see that helicopter depart about five minutes prior to making their own taxi call. And it shouldn't have precluded the pilot of the Foxbat from at least visually acquiring the Dash 8 and the Baron. Most likely the Dash 8 and the Baron would have been all lit up like a Christmas tree with their strobes and landing lights on. So not only is communication in the non-towered airport environment a vital part of our safety, but so is a disciplined lookout as well, using the good old Mark 1 eyeball. So why didn't perhaps the Foxbat see the other traffic in the circuit area? There could be a host of reasons. First of all, Visual scanning technique. Was the pilot just looking out into space or was the pilot actually taking the time and the discipline to do a judicious lookout across the visual scanning horizon? Keep our eyes moving. We're in a dynamic environment, remember. Things rarely stay the same. When we're undertaking a lookout in a CTAF environment, it's very, very important to keep that visual scanning technique up to scratch. It's not my role here to teach you how to visually scan. That's something that you can do with your instructor. But a visual scanning technique when we're flying around or even on the manoeuvring area of an airport is vital. Secondly, environmental conditions can be a problem with achieving a good lookout. Not only things like cloud, but also things like smoke or haze or pollution or rain. Even flying with a dirty windscreen can be difficult. Okay, try landing into the setting sun, landing towards the west late in the afternoon with a dirty windscreen. Very, very difficult to maintain an effective lookout that way. Task overload. We are in a, a busy environment, dealing with the aircraft, dealing with other traffic, dealing with issues that come up when we go flying. It's very, very difficult to maintain a good lookout. It's important that we learn that skill as we go flying to not only manage the, those aspects of our flight, but to do so without it compromising our ability to keep our eyes outside the cockpit. Aircraft structure. Many aircraft, for example, have window pillars and other bits and pieces. We have bits and pieces sitting on the combing of the aircraft on the instrument panel that might block, physically block our ability to look out. Therefore, we don't just look out by moving our eyes. Oftentimes we have to look out by craning our head and moving our head. It is important that we, that we use all of these things to maintain a good lookout. There's a term here called empty field myopia. Empty field myopia is essentially what our eye does when there's nothing much to look at. If there's nothing much for our eye to focus on, we might be flying through cloud or at, on a dark night, we might be flying through haze or an inversion, or we might be flying over a large body of water. There might not be a lot for our eye to focus on. If that's the case, the human eye will often have a resting focal length somewhere between three and five feet outside the cockpit window. That's where the eye will rest if we just let it sit there. Hence, a way of beating this empty field myopia is to keep our eyes moving and to also keep our head moving. And finally, the blind spot. What is the blind spot? 
All this is is just a physiological limitation of our eye. It's where our optic nerve hits the back of the retina. At that point in each of our eyes, there are no photoreceptors, there are no rods and cones to provide us with vision. So if we aren't moving our eye, we can have a blind spot literally outside the cockpit where we could potentially have another aircraft sitting there and we might not even know it. It's just a physiological limitation of the eye. So what I'm going to do now is show you a quick video. This video, I understand, was a training flight over southern England, and it gives you an indication as to how easy it is to miss other aircraft and the importance of maintaining a good lookout. So we're flying along in southern England, and have a look at this video. See if you can see that other aircraft. Very, very difficult to see. Very, very difficult to see. But when we zoom in, you can see that that other aircraft was in fact a business jet, almost at the same level, blending into the cloud. So let's play that video once again. This time, see if you can see the business jet approaching from the top left-hand side of the screen. Flying along, and you see the aircraft appear out of the top left. Very, very difficult to see. Lots of distractions potentially in that cockpit. It looked to me like it was an instructional flight but we can certainly be surprised when we go flying around, especially the busy airspace around capital cities and busy CTAF airports. So, alerted see and avoid, which essentially is the correct use of our radio combined with a disciplined lookout. If we use not only our eyesight, but also our radio appropriately, we have, according to ATSB research, something like an 800% better chance of spotting other traffic than if we were just using our eyesight alone. We mandate rate VHF radio carriage around the vicinity of CTAF environments in Australia. I don't want to harp too much on the regulation, but it's a good idea just to perhaps review this. Car 166E talks about mandatory VHF radio carriage. We mandate the carriage of VHF radio when we are at or in the vicinity of any certified, registered, or military aerodrome in Australia, or any other aerodrome that we may designate from time to time. That might be something like a fly-in or something similar like that. That's where we mandate the carriage of VHF radio in Australia. We talk a lot about what do we mean by in the vicinity. There are really three pillars to this in the vicinity concept. The first is, we are in airspace that is other than controlled airspace. So essentially we're talking about class G uncontrolled airspace. In the vicinity also means within 10 nautical miles of the aerodrome reference point. Now that doesn't automatically mean that we flick across to the CTAF frequency when we get to 10 miles. If you're flying a fast aircraft, or if you're flying into a destination that you know there's a good chance the circuit might be busy, there's certainly nothing stopping you flicking across to that CTAF frequency at 15 miles or even 20 miles. The Dash 8 that we saw in our scenario earlier most likely flicked across to the Port Macquarie CTAF at 30 miles. What this does, especially if you fly a fast aircraft or you're going into a busy environment, is it provides you with time to build that mental picture. So you don't always have to wait to bang on 10 miles before you go across to the CTAF. Now the third pillar which describes in the vicinity, one concept that often causes some confusion and debate among pilots, is when we are at a height above the aerodrome reference point that either conflicts or has the potential to conflict with other traffic. Now it's not up to us in CASA to tell you what that height is. That's essentially the decision made by the pilot in command, and that can vary depending on circumstances. You might fly across the top of a non-towered airport at 2,000 feet at 3 o'clock in the morning. The chances are that you won't be at a height that might conflict with other traffic. But to fly across the top of that airport at 2,000 feet on a busy Saturday afternoon, again, that's a whole new different ball game. Be aware also, when we're talking about the height above a non-towered airport, that CTAF airports in Australia, they are no longer cylinders of airspace. There's no defined top to them. Back in many, many years before, we had things like MBZs and things like that, which had a defined top, but not anymore. The height above the aerodrome that you might have the potential to conflict with operations, that's a decision for the pilot in command and the pilot in command only. 
Please also be aware that there is no silver bullet of regulation that will guarantee 100% risk-free aviation all the time. The CTAF environment is a very dynamic environment. What we have done is we've put out, for example, certain recommended radio calls that will give you the best chance of separating yourself. One last thing before we look at those radio calls that I just want to mention. Please also be aware that Air Services Australia do not monitor CTAF frequencies. Air Services Australia also do not monitor 1267. So the appropriate frequency selection is very important. When you are beyond the vicinity of a non-towered airport, it's important to be maintaining a listening watch on the appropriate frequency, which will be the area frequency. It's only on the area frequency that you will get assistance. If your aircraft cabin fills full of smoke or your windscreen is covered in oil and you have to call a pan or a mayday. If you call a pan or a mayday on 1267, or if you call a pan or mayday or call for assistance on the CTAF frequency, the chances are that no one will hear you. It's the published area frequency that you will get that assistance from air services. So when in the vicinity, people often ask us, what are the mandatory radio calls? The only thing that we mandate in the regulations is that a pilot must make a broadcast whenever they, and they alone, believe that it's reasonably necessary to do so to avoid a collision or the risk of a collision with another aircraft. As far as mandating calls, that's the only thing we mandate. But we do go further than that. What we actually do is we recommend a set of standard calls. And we put that out in our Civil Aviation Advisory publication, CAP 166. So, when in the vicinity of a non-towered aerodrome, what are the recommended calls? We find that the vast, vast majority of pilots make these calls in a fantastic way. They're very judicious, they're very disciplined, but there's always room for improvement. So, what are these calls? A taxing call, entering the runway, inbound by 10 nautical miles or earlier. Remember our previous discussion, if you're flying a fast aircraft or you're likely to come into a busy airport, there's nothing wrong with making an inbound call earlier. Joining the circuit. Basic calls that most people do make. We also recommend that if you are doing something slightly different or something slightly out of the ordinary, for example, a straight in approach or you might be joining on base leg of the circuit. It's a good idea to let people know that you might be doing something slightly different. So we certainly recommend those types of calls. And finally, if you are just passing the aerodrome in the vicinity of that aerodrome, just make a call on the CTAF to let people know where you are and what you are doing. And finally, a small hint that I like to often give to IFR pilots. If you're an IFR aircraft flying an IFR sortie, especially when there's likely to be VFR aircraft in the vicinity, please don't use IFR-based terminology. Think again what we said earlier about your intended audience. The average VFR pilot might not know what a sector entry is. They might not know what an initial approach fix is for a GNSS approach. They don't have to. Think about your intended audience. Give a direction from the airport, a distance and a height and your intentions. Okay especially for the IFR pilots when there's likely to be VFR aircraft in the vicinity. The second part of our presentation focuses on this concept called situational awareness. I spoke at the outset that situational awareness is a huge topic on its own. Again, many people go to university and study this field of endeavor for many years, but we're just going to have a quick look at situational awareness and emphasize the importance that situational awareness has within the non-towered aerodrome environment. Not just the non-towered aerodrome environment, but even some of our busy towered aerodromes, situational awareness is vital for safe operations. So here's a classic example, Moorabbin Airport, basically the busiest airport in Australia in terms of movements, somewhere up nudging the 350,000 movements a year. What do we have here at Moorabbin? We have five runways, all crisscrossing, and two runways are usually in use at any one time. Busy airspace, many people learning to fly, huge amounts of landings and takeoffs. Situational awareness in an environment like Moorabbin is vital for aviation safety. What I'm going to show you now is a, a video clip from an ATSB investigation of a very close call at Moorabbin Airport, where we see one pilot using really good situational awareness and another pilot where perhaps situational awareness had broken down. So what we have here is a 
piece of video footage shot out of the right hand seat of a Cessna aircraft. This Cessna aircraft was coming into land on runway 13 right. And as I play this piece of uh, footage, I want you to keep your eye on the top left hand side of the screen as we play it through. So the aircraft is coming down final. Everything is going quite, uh, quite okay. No dramas here. The aircraft comes in over the undershoot and over the piano keys and starts its landing sequence. Have a look at the top left hand side of the screen for me as we go through that footage. And what can you see? An aircraft coming out of nowhere, a Cessna 172, that has punched across a holding point onto an active runway. We'll explain the details as to how this occurred later. But with something like this, let me put it to you. What do you think might have happened next? Well, we have a choice. You could select the 172 to the left might have stopped short. Or alternatively, did the aircraft collide on the runway? Or thirdly, maybe the landing aircraft did a go round. So have a think about it, make your choice, and let's see actually what happened in reality. What happened in reality is that the very good situational awareness of the landing aircraft pilot initiated a go round. By using their situational awareness, they managed to avoid what could have potentially been a collision on the runway. That event was a very, very close run thing. Again, we're not here to throw sticks or stones at any of these pilots or to make judgments. What we're here to do is perhaps look at the facts before us and take away some key learnings that we can introduce into our own flying. So what actually happened? We had two aircraft. The landing aircraft was the pink aircraft on runway 13 right. But the aircraft that encroached across the holding point had landed on runway 13 left, slightly before the pink aircraft. As you can see here, the aircraft on the blue runway had landed and taxied off that runway and had encroached across the holding point, as you can see on the right hand side of that picture. Interviews with the pilots of both aircraft confirmed that one of the reasons why that aircraft punched across the holding point was simply distraction. The aircraft that punched across the holding point had two pilots on board. It was an instructor and a student. And it was simply the fact that they had started their debrief of their lesson while they were still taxiing across all the runways. They weren't perhaps keeping an eye out, therefore missed the holding point and punched across. We need our situational awareness to be top notch, especially when we're flying around busy aerodrome environments. Be they a controlled aerodrome like Moorabbin or Bankstown or Jandicott, or many of the CTAFs around the country. Because remember, at a CTAF, we don't have air traffic controllers. There's not that second pair of eyes that can assist us. There's no one to tell us to line up. There's no one to give us a clearance to take off or clearance to land. In the non-towered aerodrome environment, we as pilots in command, we make those decisions. There's no ATC to help us. So, no video that we produce would be complete without the obligatory cat video. So here's another example of a classic distraction that occurred when we can go flying. This I understand occurred in Africa. A couple of people going flying in a light sport home built. Watch the top right hand side of the screen as we see a cat mysteriously appear out of the wing. Cat's quite happy actually, enjoying, enjoying the flight. Comes closer to the edge and just loves the view. Notice how the people haven't seen the cat yet, especially the pilot, but have a good look at his eyes when he actually finally sees the cat. Not really something you'd expect to see when you go flying. Another example of a distraction that can potentially come out of the blue. Have a look at his eyes, he's absolutely shocked. No cat was actually harmed in the filming of that video. The aircraft did manage to come around and land and they removed the cat. Maybe it might have said perhaps something about the robustness of the pilot's pre-flight check, not sighting a cat in a ring. Classic example of distraction. Distractions can come in all sorts of ways. Distraction from ATC, distraction from passengers, distraction even from things like a cat or a piece of wildlife. So what is situational awareness and how on earth can we improve it when we go flying? I want to break situational awareness down basically into its most simple concept. It's essentially a three-step process. The first step is what has happened in the past, 
what is currently happening now and what's going to happen in the future. We make those decisions when we go flying often instantly without even thinking about it. We use our situational awareness whenever we are consciously awake. When we're driving a car, when we're walking down a set of stairs, when we're making a cup of tea, our brain goes through this three-step process often without us even realizing it. And when we go flying, we're doing that exact same three-step process. But because when we're going flying, it's a very dynamic environment, isn't it? It's an environment that operates in three dimensions. And therefore, until we build up our experience as aviators, we can have difficulty putting these three steps together. Classic example is that at the moment, I'm teaching my 16-year-old daughter how to drive. She's building her situational awareness on the road. So that three-step process is certainly happening for her, but it's not as smooth as anyone that might have been driving like myself for over 35 years. Here's a different way of looking at situational awareness. And there are many models out there that can help us describe this concept. Let's have a look at this different model. First of all, we perceive what is out there around us. You might ask, well, how do we perceive things? Well, we use our five senses. Our five senses tell us what's happening in time and space around us whenever we are consciously awake. So first of all, we perceive what's around us. In other words, where is the aircraft? The second step is to comprehend. What does that mean for me? Okay, what is the aircraft actually doing? Is it climbing? Is it descending? Is it in a turn? Am I slowing down? Am I speeding up? Am I to the left of the runway or the right of the runway? The third and final step, or stage three of situational awareness, is to project ahead into the future. In other words, what's going to happen? What's going to happen in the next 15 seconds? What's going to happen when I'm reached a leg of the circuit? What's going to happen in the next hour? Or maybe even for the Qantas pilot flying home from the United States, what's going to happen or what will my aircraft be in in 15 hours time? Where those three things intersect that's the sweet spot of situational awareness, as you can see in the diagram. So how does that relate then to someone who's an experienced pilot who might have a very well-developed situational awareness versus someone that's perhaps learning to fly? Let's have a look. Situational awareness. Go back to your very first flight, maybe your very first session of circuits where you were probably having a brain overload and struggling to keep up with the aircraft. You had perception, you certainly had comprehension, and you were developing your ability to project. So your situational awareness was still in its infancy. But perhaps when you were doing your first flight, your situational awareness in total, where those three things intersect, was only very small. But a more experienced pilot still does those three things, but the sweet spot's a lot greater. They have a greater grasp on situational awareness. What does that mean? What that means is that with a greater understanding or a greater sense of situational awareness, we can devote more cognitive brain space to working out what else is happening around the aircraft, such as working out where other traffic is, how I'm going to separate myself, dealing with checklists, dealing with passengers and those sorts of things. So one of the things I want you to think about when you're watching our video today, reflect on your own flying. What are some of the clues in my own flying that might give me an inkling that perhaps I'm losing situational awareness. And when we talk to most pilots, and myself included, there have been many occasions where we have lost situational awareness. So what are some of these red flags? The first one is ambiguity or even confusion. Classic case, the iPad says that I'm here. However, when I look out of the cockpit, it doesn't match what I'm seeing on my map. Instant loss of situational awareness. Secondly, fixation. That is fixating or concentrating on one thing in the cockpit to the exclusion of everything else, okay? A dangerous place to be because all our attention, all our cognitive thought processes are devoted to one particular thing and we very quickly lose sight of that bigger picture. Failure to fly the aircraft. This is another big thing. Sometimes we use the adage that too many cooks spoil the broth. In other words, having two pilots on board an aircraft when there isn't a clear division of duties. When we read the accident report and the book about QF32, the A380 that blew up its engine over Singapore, 
There was a lot of experience on that flight deck. When that event occurred, there were ICAST messages going off, there were alarms and bells and all sorts of things happening in that cockpit. But one of the first things the crew did was that they nominated one particular person to fly the aircraft and let everyone else deal with the emergency and run the checklists. Fourthly, failure to look outside. And you might think to yourself, well, surely that's just a given. But perhaps think back to our initial scenario at Port Macquarie with the Foxbat pilot. Maybe a more disciplined lookout might have saved the day. The AOPA, or the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association in the United States, did some research, I understand, recently where they hooked up VFR pilots with various biometric sensors where they could track where their eyes were looking on a typical VFR flight. They found most pilots on a typical VFR flight had their head inside the cockpit over 50% of the time because there's lots of things to distract us in the cockpit. There's all our instruments, there's passengers, there's our iPads, there's all sorts of electronic flight instruments which are very attractive and can, and can attract the eye. So failure to look outside is a big one. Maybe even back to our Moorabbin example, where the aircraft taxied across the holding point. Failure to meet estimated times of arrival. Failure to meet things like targets or speeds or altitudes will also give you an instant loss of situational awareness. So will failure to fly our aircraft within limitations or even the regs. What regulations do or what limitations do that we might find, for example, in the flight manual is it provides us as pilots with a frame of reference within which to operate. We go outside that frame of reference and we are really in uncharted territory, especially when it comes to things like our flight envelope and things like center of gravity. When we fly outside those limits in our flight manual, well then congratulations because we've just become test pilots. Because Mr. Cessna and Mr. Piper and Mr. Beechcraft, they wash their hands. You operate outside those limits, you are essentially on your own. We don't know how the aircraft is going to handle or how the aircraft is going to react. And finally, and we've spoken about this in our previous talk about communication, failure to communicate effectively. If our language is vague, if the information we're giving is incomplete, or if there's too much information. All of these things should be red flags or identify with us as clues that perhaps our situational awareness is starting to deteriorate. So when we next go flying, have a think about these things, how we perhaps react to them, and let those be little triggers in our mind that perhaps our situational awareness is starting to reduce. How can we improve our situational awareness when we go flying? There are things we can do. First of all, we have this saying, if it feels wrong, it probably is. You're never going to find this rule or that statement in any regulation or anywhere in rules that we publish, but it's that old gut instinct. And especially if you've been flying for quite a while and have sufficient experience, it's amazing how accurate that gut instinct is. And I'm sure most of us have either been flying or driving or been in any other part of our life and we get that feeling, that inner sense that something isn't just quite right. It's amazing how accurate that can be. Secondly, a sterile cockpit rule. The airlines and the military are very hot on things like sterile cockpit. All that really means is, especially for the airlines, is that from basically pushback to departure and climb through about 10,000 feet, the only conversation on the flight deck is operational conversation only. We don't talk about the footy scores or what we're doing on Saturday night. And the same on descent. From about 10,000 feet until we're at the gate, again, operationally relevant conversation. Why? Because that's the busy part of the flight where distraction has the potential to reduce our situational awareness. Now, I'm not saying that we have to establish a sterile cockpit rule for our own private or recreational flying, but you might want to think about perhaps asking your passengers that perhaps when we're in the circuit area, just keep the volume of our conversation down or even just stay quiet unless you see something that I need to be aware of. Again, just in the circuit area or in those very busy phases of flight. Thirdly, fly within our personal limits. It might be personal limits with regards to visibility or other weather related phenomena. It could be personal limits with regards to the way the aircraft handles, such as crosswind limits. We go outside those personal limits. Again, we do run the risk of losing our situational awareness because we could potentially find ourselves in an environment that we're not used to.
okay? Personal limits do play a large factor, especially for a lot of pilots that might not fly that regularly, whose experience levels or recency levels might not be fully as developed as people that might fly every week. Learn to recognize those red flags. We spoke about them on the previous slide. We each might react to those red flags differently, but think about our own flying. Think about the previous flights that we've flown. Even when we've landed after a flight, just spend some time thinking about the flight we've just completed. Was there any little red flag on that flight that could have potentially led me to a reduction of situational awareness? And finally, that old adage, prioritize what we do in the cockpit. We aviate first, we fly the aircraft first, then we navigate and be aware of our position and where we're going. And finally, in order, we communicate our intentions. We go back to those old lessons that still hold true today. Our final topic today is entitled threat and error management. Threat and error management has been a term around the aviation industry for at least 20 years. It originally started back in the early 90s, I understand, out of the University of Texas. Essentially, it's a way of looking at airmanship that old concept of airmanship anyway, but in more of an enhanced way. In some respects, enhanced airmanship is a good name for it. I also look upon threat and error management as almost like defensive flying in a, perhaps a similar way that we look at defensive, the concept of defensive driving. And there are some terms, there are some terms in threat and error management that we need to perhaps just get straight in our head. And these are terms that we've heard, I'm sure, around the traps. The first one is the, the terminology of essentially what is a threat. A threat is essentially something that comes externally towards the pilot that requires some action in order to maintain a margin of safety. Now those threats can be anything from turbulence or bad weather. A threat can be something that might be going wrong mechanically with the aircraft. Air traffic control in itself can perhaps be a threat to the safety of the aircraft, especially if it introduces a distraction. In some respects, we might even be a threat to ourselves. How could we be a threat to ourselves? Well, we might, for example, go flying with a horrible head cold, or we might be going flying when perhaps we are not as current or as recent as we'd like. So that's the essential concept of what we mean by threat. Now, the University of Texas had introduce this concept called line-oriented safety audits. Essentially, it's something the airlines use where they put an observer in the cockpit of an airliner, not to form part of the functioning crew, but just to watch the crew's interactions and record how many or what type of threats come at the pilot and how they deal with those threats. Do they cause or make an error in dealing with those threats. And there's some interesting data that I thought I'd share with you. And we can perhaps extrapolate some of this or at least try and frame it in the way that we go flying. What this line oriented safety data or LOSA data has shown us with um, information coming in from a huge variety of databases. So there's a lot of information here is that 40% of all threats coming at a flight crew usually come in the pre-departure and the taxi phase, while 30% of threats come at a flight crew in the descent, approach and landing phase of flight. Each flight, on average, the crew has to deal with just over four threats on average, and they might be anything, as we've said earlier, from weather or ATC-related threats, it might be turbulence, it could be anything. The most common threats facing flight crew are usually to do with weather or air traffic control instructions or trying to comply with what ATC tell the crew to do. 85 to 95 of those threats are quite successfully managed by the crew, but about one in 10 threats lead to some type of error by the flight crew in managing that error, okay? Or managing that threat. Mismanaged threats are mainly in the operation of the aircraft ATC or weather related. So in threat and error management, the other concept that you'll hear is just this terminology of error. Error is something that we commit as human beings whenever we are consciously awake. We never wake up in the morning saying to ourselves that we're going to commit an error. It's just a byproduct of being human. It's something the pilot in an aviation context might do or fail to do 
that results in a reduction in safety margin. And we divide those errors up into two things, an error of commission or an error of omission. An error of commission is when we do something in error. An error of omission is when we might forget to do something. For example, we forget to change a radio frequency. Or we may even forget to put the landing gear down. They reduce our safety margins and they increase the probability of our aircraft entering into an adverse event. So here's an example on our slide. A pilot inadvertently might select 126.8 instead of 126.7. Not done intentionally, it was just by pure accident. Classic example of a small error. Let's think back to our Foxbat example at the start of our presentation in Port Macquarie. I'm sure the pilot didn't deliberately go flying with the volume turned down. That was an error. It's a byproduct of being human. So let's talk about errors in the line oriented safety audit space that we've, we've been speaking about earlier. Interesting statistic here with all this data is that 45% of errors committed by flight crew actually go undetected by the crew. Why? Because we are human. Okay, we've spoken, as you can see there, about errors of commission and errors of omission. It's the approach, descent and landing phase where most errors are occurring, anywhere up to about 40%, as you can see from the statistics. 55% of all errors in that phase are actually mismanaged by the crew. Quite significant numbers, really. And in total, about a quarter of all errors that occur on the flight deck are not managed properly. Now these stats come out of the airline world, but I thought it might be worthwhile for us to at least have a look at this stuff and maybe think how this might apply to our general aviation and recreational flying that we do. When we talk about error, I think it's also important to look at the other side of error and that is the concept of violation. And the whole concept about violation revolves around intent. Was it deliberate or was it not deliberate? Violation is something that is intentional. It is an intentional deviation from some rule, from some standard operating procedure or limitation that we do deliberately. And it's all done or it's all centered around intent. Classic example, a pilot for didn't decide to make a radio call to avoid paying landing fees. Classic case of a violation. The real danger with violation is when we are actually successful at it. Because when we are successful at violating, what that does is that it encourages us to do it again, and to do it again, and do it again, and do it again. And we continue being successful at it until one day circumstances might be slightly different and we end up with a major event. Classic case, if you want a good read one night, is to open up and have a read of the accident report of Space Shuttle Challenger. Classic case of what we call the normalization of deviance. In other words, where intentional violation over time starts to become the norm. Now in our own flying, for example, we might regularly fly with our aircraft above its max takeoff weight, or it might be out of balance, or we might regularly go flying when the VMC conditions might not exist. We might get away with that, we might continue to get away with that over the years. We might continue to be successful, but until one day something might be slightly different and it results in an accident. Now, all human beings violate. Again, I often think that it's also part of being human. And in our seminars, I will often ask the audience, who here has violated? And you might only get a few hands go up. So then I pose the question to the audience, so who here has gone through a roadwork zone at 45 instead of 40? We all have. We've made a deliberate decision that no, I'm not going to go through that roadwork zone at 40, I'll only go at 45. But it's something that we do intentionally. And again, especially in aviation or other forms of transport, of course, the real danger is when we're successful at it. The final concept when we talk about the idea of threat and error management is this term called an undesired aircraft state. You might have heard this term spoken around the flying club or have read it in magazines, seen it on the Flight Safety Australia website, accident reports, that type of thing. An undesired aircraft is simply a position or an attitude or a configuration of an aircraft 
as a result of something that the pilot does or doesn't do that results in a reduced margin of safety. So what do we mean in reality by an undesired aircraft state? An undesired aircraft state might be uh, having an aircraft in a stalled configuration only 100 feet above the ground. That would be an undesired aircraft state. Or be halfway across Bass Strait with only five minutes of fuel remaining. Again, an undesired aircraft state. Or an aircraft that punches across a holding point onto an active runway. In other words, wrong place, wrong time. Significantly reduced safety margin. It's what we call an undesired aircraft state. And there's an example there. The pilot might realise their error and hold short, taxi off the runway, realising that the aircraft is in a, in a position that safety is actually reduced. So here's a classic example. An aircraft on the left hand side, our blue aircraft, taxis past the holding point onto the flight strip of an active runway. An aircraft on short final sees this aircraft taxi across the holding point and readjusts its approach path at the final minute and actually starts to land within the flight strip. Classic case of some undesired aircraft states. And let's start to pick apart this small example in terms of threat and error management. So what threats can you identify with that scenario? First of all, the aircraft that's taxied onto the flight strip beyond the holding point is too close to the landing aircraft and definitely represents a threat to that landing aircraft. Secondly, the landing aircraft is operating with reduced lateral separation from the aircraft on the ground and represents a threat to that aircraft on the ground. The other threat is that the landing aircraft has a reduced lateral area available within which to manoeuvre. Okay, or to deal with any other thing that might come at that aircraft, such as a crosswind or a handling error. Again, represents a threat to that aircraft that's coming into land. So what errors or violations might have occurred in this example? Okay, let's pick this apart. First of all, the pilot proceeded past a holding point with an aircraft on short final. Was that an error? Potentially. Could have also been a violation. Sometimes you have to dig a bit deeper. What else do we have? The landing pilot didn't go around, didn't actually commence a go round, even though the aircraft had approached into his runway. Now there may have been mitigating circumstances. The pilot coming into land may have been running out of daylight. He may have been running out of fuel. There's a bit of light and shade there as well. Could have been error, could have been violation. The landing pilot has continued with what we call an unstable approach, where the rate of descent, altitude, airspeed, aircraft configuration were not within defined parameters. Potential error, potential violation. And there were some undesired aircraft states, aircraft that were in the wrong place at the wrong time. The aircraft is on the runway with another aircraft on short final. That aircraft on the runway was in the wrong place at the wrong time. A classic case of an undesired aircraft state. That landing aircraft was in an unstable configuration, having to manoeuvre abruptly on late final to avoid that aircraft. Again, undesired aircraft state. Wrong position on the runway during the landing and touchdown phase. So, introducing some additional threats in this scenario. The pilot on final approach sees the aircraft approach across the holding point. Says, yes, well, perhaps I could have slowed my aircraft down to give the other aircraft time to vacate. And whilst at that reduced speed, maybe I could have conducted some S turns again to further lose time, introducing what we call the unstable approach, okay? So we run the risk of trying to manage one threat and putting our aircraft in an undesired aircraft state in trying to manage an external threat. So what threats might impact on that aircraft on final approach? Clearly reduced safety margin, manoeuvring too close to the ground at low airspeed. Puts that aircraft very much into an undesired aircraft state. Could very easily lead to things like an inadvertent stall and then a spin close to the ground, which would be unrecoverable in the height remaining. We've spoken a lot about undesired aircraft states. We've also spoken a lot about unstable approaches. When we go through the ATSB database, 
and the databases around the world, we find a continuing theme that the vast majority of aircraft that run off the end of a runway or have a runway excursion off the side of a runway, the genesis or the original causal factors in that accident can usually be traced back to an unstable approach. We can reduce the risk of a runway excursion by having the discipline when we go flying to ensure that our rate of descent, our altitude, our aircraft configuration and our aircraft speed are within certain defined parameters at various points along our final approach. So what can we do to assist this? First of all, nominate where we are going to touch down and have that point nicely sorted out early in our final approach. Secondly, fly a constant profile, not too high, not too low. The last thing we want to be doing is making major adjustments to our final approach path as we get closer to land. Know the correct approach speed for our aircraft. Most light and sport and recreational aircraft pretty much have the same type of approach speed regardless of weight. But as we go up in aircraft size and aircraft weight, the ideal approach speed can actually vary quite significantly. So it's important that we have a good knowledge of our aircraft flight manual and the appropriate and correct approach speeds to fly. That's going to give us the greatest chance of preventing a runway excursion, either off the end or off the side. And finally, and this is where it comes down to pilot discipline. If we are not stabilized in our approach by a nominated height, then have the discipline to go around. Don't try and push a bad approach because often it will end in tears as we spear off the side of the runway or we land too long and we go off the end of the runway. The airlines, for example, are very hot on this. If the approach isn't stabilized by certain gates on final approach, it's a standard operating procedure to conduct a go round, bring the aircraft round and have another go at landing. Us as the recreational or the private pilot should be doing this as well. There is no shame in going round. And if it isn't right, it's a normal type of maneuver that we should be practicing regularly. And that alone will help us with our threat and error management, especially when we're close to the ground. I'll leave you with a final example of some threat and error management gone wrong. This was an example at Caloundra in a home built aircraft. The pilot was coming into runway 05 at Caloundra, recognised that there was an external threat that they had to manage. That external threat were parachutists that were under canopy and the pilot was concerned that those parachutists may drift across onto the runway strip. So the pilot therefore manoeuvred the aircraft to the right of the runway strip to perhaps give themselves more room. The pilot ended up too high on profile, so therefore too high above the ground, too late in the final approach. Instead of commencing a go round, the pilot found themselves in that situation and tried therefore in the final stages of approach to regain the correct profile by entering a side slip manoeuvre. The pilot entered the side slip manoeuvre very close to the ground, but in coming out of that side slip manoeuvre, mishandled the aircraft. The pilot unfortunately mishandled the aircraft to such an extent, the pilot lost control of the aircraft in flight and unfortunately that was the result. Four people were seriously injured, the pilot especially so. Classic case of an external threat, perhaps being managed inappropriately and errors were made in the management of that threat. Of course, it didn't help that the aircraft unfortunately was also loaded beyond its aft centre of gravity, which increased the chances of the aircraft losing control in flight. Loss of control in flight accidents, the statistics tell us, are accidents that often end up with fatalities. It's not the type of accident that we want to have. So let's review where we've been. You've joined me on a journey through three significant topics communication, situational awareness, and finally, threat and error management. So in communication, the main document that I recommend pilots go to and review is CAP 166, which talks about operating at and in the vicinity of non-towered airports. Remember, non-towered airports, we don't have air traffic control there. As a consequence, the communication that we provide on the radio is even more important. That communication needs to use standard phraseology wherever practicable. Of course, use plain language if you have to, but for all intents and purposes, that standard phraseology is very important. Think what we are about to transmit, think about the audience that we are transmitting to.
Am I likely to increase people's situational awareness or detract from it? And we have the greatest chance of spotting other aircraft in the CTAF environment if we use appropriate radio calls combined with a disciplined lookout and a scan for other traffic using our eyesight. Secondly, that communication led on to the building of situational awareness. Remember we spoke about that three-step process. Where has the aircraft been? Where am I now? Where will I be into the future? A process that doesn't come naturally, but as we gain more experience, becomes more and more intuitive to the pilot. With situational awareness, it's that one thing that will help us keep ourselves safe and alive at these non-towered aerodrome environments. Also with situational awareness, have a look at our own flying. Learn to recognise the red flags in our own operation. What are some of those little triggers that I need to keep an eye out for that may indicate to me that I'm losing situational awareness? And finally, we put all this together in our discussion of threat and error management. Whenever we go flying, it might be a flight to the other side of the country or a local flight in our circuit. Before we launch, think about what are the potential threats that might come at me externally as a pilot. It might be weather related, it might be airspace related, it might be air traffic control, it might be distraction from other passengers. Think about the threats that we're likely to face and how are we going to manage them? Do I have a plan A? Do I have a plan B? Do I even have a plan C? We often liken threat and error management to enhanced airmanship or maybe even defensive flying if you like. So that concludes our seminar series for 2018-2019. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next year with our following seminar.